Let me invite you to come with me to the Garden of Gethsemane. In the garden, we find Jesus praying the night that he would be arrested. He is in prayer while his disciples have fallen asleep. And very soon, you hear the sound of many footsteps. It's the sound of soldiers coming, officers. They have clubs and torches. And of course, Judas Iscariot very quickly comes to the forefront. He will go up to Jesus and he will greet him with a kiss. It's a kiss of friendship and loyalty. Of course, it's the exact opposite of what is actually taking place. Judas is there to betray Jesus. And what he gives Jesus with this kiss is simply a sign to make sure that those who had come to arrest Christ would know precisely who to arrest. They will take Jesus at that point and they will drag him off and he will begin going through a series of his trials. He'll go through six trials in all. The first three, of course, will be three religious Jewish trials having the charge of blasphemy. And so they'll send him in front of Annas and then Caiaphas and then ultimately the Sanhedrin. While they break their own law multiple times, it will be of no consequence to them because these men are not interested the least in justice or law keeping, just simply in having Christ put to death as quickly as they can before the crowds would stir the next morning and have any chance to stop it. And so after those three trials, he will begin the next phase of his trials, which will be three separate trials. These will be Roman legal trials. He'll go first in front of Pilate, and then in front of Herod, and then of course back again to Pilate. Pilate is under great distress at this point. He really wants nothing to do with him, and he seeks to try to get out from the weight of all of this, but it won't happen. He will take Jesus' side and say to him, don't you realize that I have the authority over you. I have the authority over whether you live or whether you die. Christ will look him in the eye and say, you have no authority whatsoever unless it's been given to you by my Father. Pilate will try to arrange a release. The crowds will have nothing of it. Eventually, when he sees that it comes down to a choice of one or two things, either doing what is right or saving his own career, Pilate will choose what is best for him, and he will sentence Christ. He will wash his hands in a basin of water, and he will make the official pronouncement, Ebus in crucem, to the cross you shall go. And they will take Jesus He will carry his cross, and then he will be crucified. From nine to noon, he will suffer at the hands of man. It is gruesome. It is violent. It is ugly. They will curse him. They will pluck the hair from his beard. They will drive spikes into his hands and his feet. It is a bloody sight. That, of course, won't be the worst of it, though. Because from noon to three, he will suffer at the hands of the Father. An event that is so dark, an event that is so awful that the earth will grow dark. It's as if what's taking place on the cross from noon to three as Christ pays for our sin is so awful and so extreme that the earth can't even seem to witness it. And then toward the end of the crucifixion, Jesus will cry out, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he will take his last breath and he will die. Professional executioners will walk by and they will see that he is absolutely for sure dead. And he will hang there. It will only be because of a couple of trusted people that he's able to have a burial at all, Joseph Arimathea will offer up his own grave. They will take the body of Jesus down off of the cross, and they will prepare it for burial. They're not able to finish it because of the Sabbath quickly approaching, and the sun will go down. 
And imagine with me what that weekend would be like. All the confusion, all the anger, the disappointment. These people had hoped in Christ, had trusted in him. They, they thought that he was the one, and now all of a sudden, the one in whom they have hoped, they have watched him die. But the ones who watched, of course, only from a distance, because at this point, those who were close to him are either running in fear or watching from a distance, wanting very little to do with him. The disciples, his closest friends, are locked away in fear, other than, of course, John, who was faithful to the end. We don't have to wonder what they thought, but we know what that weekend was like for them. Luke 24, verse 21 tells us that those who were a part of all of this that had hoped in him, they said that they had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. They had put their trust in him and, and thought, expected he really would be the redeemer, but certainly with his death, all that seems to have changed. Now what do they do? For three years, they followed him. They saw his miracles. He certainly did what no one else has ever done. He spoke and he would preach with an authority like none other. He would touch someone who has never had sight and they would see. He would heal someone who had never walked. He would even take someone who had physically died and raise them back to life. They had seen in him what they had never seen in anyone else, but now he himself has died. Their hope is gone. Is salvation a myth? Has God been defeated? Is the hope of all the years that was seemingly met in Christ now completely come undone? Friday, Saturday, early on Sunday morning now, it seems as if there's no hope left. There's nothing else to do. And so a few of his closest followers, a group of ladies, decide they might as well finish what they started. They've cried. They've wondered. They've tried to make sense of what they've seen, and they have grieved at the graphic loss of Jesus. They'll finish what they begin, and they'll get up early on Sunday morning, and they'll go to the tomb. And that brings us now to John chapter 20. Follow along with me, if you would, as I read this text. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that's of course is John, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes. As we walk through this amazing historical account, let me give you a few headings as we go. First, make note of the darkness of defeat. The darkness of defeat. Verse 1. It's the first day of the week, and Mary Magdalene has come to the tomb early. Here's the question, what will she see? 
In fact, this is a very important word all throughout this text. This idea of seeing. Understand, Mary is not coming to the tomb at this point to celebrate the resurrection. She's coming only to take care of the dead, lifeless body of Jesus. And it's interesting here that all four gospel writers refer to this day as the first day of the week rather than the third day after the crucifixion. It sure seems clear that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all seeing this event of the resurrection as that which begins something entirely new. Mary's not the only lady that's at the tomb. We know from what we would call a harmony of the Gospels, when you take all the Gospels' account, put them together, that there are other ladies that are there present. Mary is referenced, one, because she gets there first, and secondly, because it's a normal thing in Scripture to reference a group of people by the name of the leader of that group. And notice in verse 1 it says that she got there while it was still dark. This is, of course, a statement of time. It's, it's very early on the first day of the week. It is dark. But I think it also expresses something in addition to that. We know that, that John, all throughout his gospel, uses this metaphor and this contrast of light and dark. We saw it at the very beginning of the book in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In him was life. And the life was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When the text says in John 20, verse 1, it was dark, it is a factual statement. It is dark in time. It is dark in the sense of the first part of the day, but it also is extremely dark for them spiritually. I mean, all their hope has vanished. They're not going to the tomb to celebrate. They're going to the tomb to grieve, to, to mourn, to finish preparing the dead body of Jesus. It is absolutely dark. But you have to give the ladies their due. I mean, even though their faith is destroyed and even though they are heartbroken, they still are willing to go to a grave site in the dark. Who would want to do that. I mean, the, the disciples are, are locked away in fear. At least these ladies have the courage to, to go and finish the work. And so they approach with broken hearts and dashed dreams, yet they show up. And as far as they can tell, it's, it's all over. And how quickly everything changed. I mean, just a few days ago, Christ was riding into town as the people were chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna. It was a, a marvelous day. It seemed to be a victorious day. And now what do they see? Nothing but darkness. Everything seems to be defeated. They never could have imagined how upside down their entire world would become in just a few short days. Jesus had promised to triumph. He had said that the gates of Hades would not prevail against him. And now, in the present darkness of this moment, it looks for certain that hell has prevailed. The ladies don't approach the tomb on Sunday morning expecting to find it empty. They're not expecting to find a resurrection. They're, they're going to prepare his body. In fact, it's the very last thing they expect is to find an empty tomb. They get there, and what they would do is what was custom of the day. The body would be washed. It would be wrapped in linen cloths, and spices would be applied John 20, verse 1 says it right. It is dark. It is dark in the sense of the day, and it is even darker in the sense of the emotion of the moment. The one in whom they had hoped had died. There was no doubt about that. And they experienced the darkness of defeat. But make note, secondly, of 
the delusion of doubt. We see that in the rest of verse 1 and verse 2. It says, they saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. The Bible tells us that what's happened is that an earthquake has taken place and an angel of God has rolled the stone away. The stone had been sealed and soldiers were keeping watch over it. But understand, there is nothing that man could do that would be any match for the plan and the purpose and the power of God. It says in verse 2 that she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, a reference there to John. And Mary runs to tell them the news, and Mary thinks that she has terrible news, that the body of Christ has been stolen. In reality, she has the greatest news ever known to man, that Jesus is alive. That's why the tomb is empty. Verse 2, they said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. She's a devoted friend, but she's filled with doubt. She was faithful to the end, but she has no hope at this point. And for the followers of Jesus, things have gone from victory to defeat in just a few days. But they will soon realize that Christ has gone from death to triumph. They just don't see it yet. Which leads us to a third observation, and that's the light of life. The light of life. Look with me in verse 3. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. So what happens is the sun continues to rise, and daylight is beginning to overtake the darkness. On a spiritual level, it's because the sun has risen. Darkness will never overcome light again. Everything is different. Everything is new, and they're about to find out why. Verse 4 says both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Verse 5, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Now, the language here is extremely important. I want to help you to see this. Make a note, and you'll see as we go through this the next few minutes how important this is. Verse 5, stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. The word for saw in the original text here is the word blepo. The word blepo means to, to glance or to have a quick look. Nothing more intended than that. It's just something that he observed. By this point in the day, there is now enough sunlight to be able to look into the empty tomb, and he observes, he sees what's going on. He doesn't understand, he just observes. And one of the things he observes are the grave clothes. The grave clothes are, it's a very important part of the story, because what would happen is the Egyptians would embalm their dead. In Rome and in in Greece, they would typically cremate their dead, but not so in Palestine. In Palestine, what you would do is you would not embalm and you wouldn't cremate. You would take the body of the deceased and you would wash the body and you would then wrap it with these linen strips. You would take spices and put it in the enclosure in the strips and the deceased would lie down, usually with their arms crossed. We know from John 19 that about 75 pounds of spices have been provided to be able to do this, and they would take aloe, and they would take this aloe, which would be a powdered wood, like a a fine sawdust, and they would then mix it with myrrh, which was a, a kind of a fragrant gum that would mix with the powder. And John sees that the body is missing, but the, the grave clothes are lying in, in perfect order. They've not been disturbed. They've not been ripped. They've not been torn. This isn't a case where someone has stolen the body. If they had stolen the body, they wouldn't leave the strips behind. And for that matter, if you were going to steal the body, you would want to leave the body wrapped in the strips. It would make it easier to carry. And the grave clothes are undisturbed. It's as if a body has just passed right through. Which gets us to verse 6 that says, Simon Peter came 
following him, and he went into the tomb. So John gets to the tomb first, but, but Peter goes into the tomb first. And this was just Peter's personality, wasn't it? Peter was moved first and asked questions later. In fact, it was just a, a few months ago when I was here, we were studying through uh, the, the Gospel of John in chapter 18, and it told us that this is the same Peter who would take a swing at the head of Malchus and cut off his ear. And you know why he cut off his ear? Because he missed. You don't swing at ears, you swing at necks. This is who Peter was. Swing first, ask questions later. So John gets to the tomb first, and he waits, and he pauses, and he looks, and here comes Peter. He gets to the tomb second, but he goes first into the tomb. Verse 6 and 7, he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And the word translated in English says lying there, that the original text here, it's a word that means something that is in careful order. It's calm, it's neat, it's undisturbed. And this reminds us that this is an altogether different event than when Lazarus had been raised back to life. In chapter 11 of John, Lazarus is raised But his hands and his feet were still bound with linen strips. His face was still wrapped with the cloth. And the reason is because Lazarus was raised, but still with a mortal body that would die again. Not so with Jesus. Jesus has been raised in his glorified body, having passed right through the grave clothes, just as he would pass eventually right through the doors where the disciples were meeting. The body had not been stolen. Christ has been resurrected, forever proving victory over sin and hell and the grave. And it's interesting as we look at the wording here of the text, when John got there, he looked in verse 5 and he saw the linen cloths. Again, that word was blepo. But as we keep reading, we, we see a, a different word being used now. As Peter looks in and sees what's going on, it's not the word blepo that's used now in verse 6. It's a different word, theoreo. And you can hear our English word coming from that. Theoreo, meaning to, to look at and to ponder. Blepo was the first word that John looked at and he saw it. He didn't understand it, he just observed it. And now, as Peter goes into the tomb, he, he looks at the grave clothes and he saw it. Theoreo, to, to think about, to begin to ponder. We get our English word for theory or to theorize from this word. And what you see is a progression of understanding. John saw and just observed. Peter saw, and he began to consider and think and ponder, which leads us to a fourth point, and that is the blessing of believing. The blessing of believing. Look at verse 8. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw There's that English word again. He saw and believed. It's a different word in the Greek, though. It's actually a a third different word that translated into English as saw. First was the word blepo, meaning just to to glance or to, to notice. Theoreo was the second word, meaning to ponder or to consider. And now a third word is used here in verse 8. The word is horao, meaning to see with comprehension. For the first time, he begins to really see what's taking place. John has gone in, it says, and he saw and believed. He, he understood. He, he comprehended. He didn't just see it. He didn't just theorize. He began to understand exactly what's taking place. And the words of Jesus that he had spoken long ago are now coming alive to him. 
Mark chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, Jesus has told them that he would rise again. As they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matters to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. That was Mark 9. And now as Peter and John have gone into the tomb, John begins to understand this is what he meant. So massive was this event. So forever life-changing is this moment. That from that moment on, we begin to see that the, the followers of Christ, the true God-fearers, will begin to worship on Sunday because it's the day of the resurrection, the day that everything changed. John begins to see, to really see what's going on. And this, this is my fear for so many of us that we would be accustomed to the story, that we would know the details and and know how the, the story ends, but I ask you this morning, do you really see what's going on here? Do you really see? Not just a question of are you looking, and, and do you know the names, and do you know the events, and for others, maybe you could even tell the story in a very clear and compelling way, but my question to you is, do you really see what's taking place? Do you comprehend the magnitude of the resurrection of Christ? Do you understand how significant it is that Christ died and he died in the place of all of those who would believe so that we could have our sin forgiven, so that we could have salvation? For so many, they will glance at this story, maybe even theorize about it, but they will stop short of comprehending the significance of this moment. Verse 9 makes clear that's where the disciples had been. It says, for as yet they did not understand the Scripture. They didn't see it until this moment. Even though Jesus had talked about it, and, and though Christ himself had said, if you destroy this temple on the third day, I will rebuild it. Though he told them of his coming death and resurrection, they did not see it until now. And how interesting is it that those who did not believe in Christ, they were concerned about this, so much so that they said, we've got to put a stone in front of the tomb, and we've got to get soldiers to be on guard all around the tomb, and we've got to put a seal on top of that to show the seriousness and the power and the authority of the government. In fact, as has been said, it, it seems as though the opponents of Christ were far more concerned that Jesus might rise again than the followers of Christ were convinced it was even possible. The scripture says in verse 9, he must rise from the dead. Why must Christ rise? Why, why did Christ have to die? You remember back on the cross when he is hanging there suffering in agony. One of the things that he cries out is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what a gift it is that Christ did not merely pray that or ask that. He didn't do it silently. He said so out loud. And this is of paramount importance, that Christ would say out loud, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me so that it could be heard, so that it could be written down, so that it could be preserved, so that we would be forced to consider that question, why is Christ being forsaken on the cross? What is he doing on the cross? Well, what he's doing is he's paying for our sin. What's happening on the cross is he who knew no sin is becoming sin for us so that we who were so guilty and vile could have the righteousness of Christ imputed to our account. 
What's happening on the cross is Jesus is satisfying the wrath of a holy God so that we who ourselves were sinners could be forgiven and welcomed into the family of God. That's why he's on the cross and why he must rise again is because a dead Savior is no Savior at all. He must rise again because he must triumph over his enemies. He must rise again to vindicate his gospel claims. He must rise again to prove and to demonstrate that the Father's wrath has been perfectly satisfied. And so Christ must rise. And in so doing, Christ becomes the first fruit, and we are the harvest which means that what is true of Christ and his glorified body will, will be true of us, that we too will be raised if we are in Christ, and we too will enjoy life without death. It is true to say that death will be our gain in every conceivable way because Christ has risen. And this is what gives us hope. This is why we live with such gospel-fueled courage, because we have a Savior who has overcome, we have a Savior who has conquered, we have a Savior who has been crucified on our, in our place, dying in our place so that we could live with him. This is why Philippians 1 says to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because we have nothing to fear. Because Christ has defeated death for us. He is the first fruit. We will be the harvest. One day we will enjoy a life and an existence free from sin and free from shame and free from tears and forever free from death. Reminds me of a story that D.L. Moody used to tell of a young teenage girl who had been stricken with a very severe disease. The doctor came to her house and was visiting with her and her parents about her condition, which was terrible and not going to improve. In fact, the, the doctor said to the parents with the little girl lying there in her bed, he said, she has seen her best days, this poor child. To which this young girl, full of boldness and full of courage, protested and said, no, doctor, I must tell you, my best days are yet to come when I shall see my king in all of his beauty. Jesus said, because I live, you live. And if Christ is dead, we have no hope. But he is risen. He is risen indeed, and we have every hope that we will be with him. And then verse 10, here toward the end, then the disciples went back to their homes, still trying to make sense of it all and still trying to figure out what, how it all is going to play out and, and what happens next. But as they go back to their homes, they have a story to tell. As they leave the, the site of the resurrection, as they leave the empty tomb, they go back and they have a story to tell armed with the greatest news of all time that Jesus Christ has risen just as he said. Reminds me of the words of the old hymn. We have a story to tell to the nations that will turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, a kingdom of love and light. Like the disciples, we too have a story now to tell to the nations. And our story is about a Savior who has offered salvation. Our story is that we need not be afraid as believers, no matter what the world may do to us or how they may threaten us. We have a Savior who has overcome it all. This is why the body of Christ should live fearlessly. As A.W. Tozier once said, a, a terrified world needs a fearless church. And we can live this way and, and we can minister and share the gospel with 
boldness and with courage because we have nothing to fear. What can man do to me? The Lord said, you don't need to fear the one who can destroy your body only. Why would we be afraid of that? Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To leave this earth behind is to enter into our eternal reward. Why would we be afraid of what man can do to us? And we have a story to tell to the nations. And it's the story of a Savior who died for us and who has been raised back to life and today lives and rules and reigns and praise God one day He is coming again. He's coming again. This is our hope. That where he is, we will be with him. Turn the page just one time, staying in chapter 20. And as we begin to wrap this up, look at verse 31. It says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is why it's written down. This is why we read this. This is why this text is proclaimed that you might believe. Not just so that you could hear the story, but that you would believe it. Not just so you could see the details, but that you would comprehend the reality of what has taken place here. So I just ask you today, do you believe in his name? Do you see who he is? I mean, do you really and truly see who he is? I'm not asking you this morning if you have heard the story of the resurrection. I'm not asking you this morning if you're familiar with what we do at Easter time. I'm not asking you this morning, even if you know some of the names and events and the people involved, I'm asking you, do you really see the significance of what has taken place? Verse 31 said that these things are written that we may believe and that by believing that we would have life, but it's life in his name. The Bible tells in the book of Philippians that Jesus suffered to the point of death, even death on the cross, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow. There will come a day, the Bible teaches us, where every single person will acknowledge the truth of who Jesus is. Everyone will acknowledge it. Now, for those who have died without faith, for them it will not be unto salvation. It's appointed the man in thy wants, and after that to face judgment, Hebrews 9 says. But make no mistake, every single person, Philippians says, in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. He will receive his due glory. But you know, there's a a philosophy in our world, very prevalent today, that says all roads lead to God. You believe what you want to believe, all roads lead to God. Doesn't matter if you are a Christian, or a Muslim, or a Buddhist, or a secularist, all roads lead to God. And of course, as they say that, what they are saying is it doesn't really matter what you believe. and There is no real objective truth. You're just free to, to think what you want and believe what you want. In the end, everything will work out for all of us because all roads lead to God, so they would say. Well, of course, we know from the authority of Scripture that what they mean by that's not true. But if you think about it, they, they are right in one way. All roads really do lead to God. They do. 
the broad road leads to God and you'll meet Him in judgment. The narrow road leads to God as you meet Him in glory. You see, in one way, the the world gets it right in this way. When you say all roads lead to God, what that truly means is no one will be able to avoid Him. It's been said, you may temporarily ignore God, you will not be able to permanently avoid Him, and that's exactly right. But when you stand before Him, you will either stand before Him as His child, covered by the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, sin forgiven by the work of Jesus, or you will stand before Him in judgment, exposed and ashamed. And I want to call you this moment to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe in His name and to find life in His name. The one who lived a perfect, sinless life, the one who went to the cross as a payment for our sin, the one who satisfied the wrath of God, the one who was crucified, buried, and praise be to God, raised back to life, where today he rules and reigns in heaven and one day is coming again to get his own. All roads will lead to God, but it makes all the difference for eternity whether you meet him as your savior or whether you meet him as your judge. You've heard the gospel today. You've heard the truth of who Jesus is. And you've seen the reality of what he has done. But I ask you one final time, do you really see? Do you really comprehend? Do you today understand that you are a sinner in need of a Savior? And do you see that the only one who can redeem is the Lord Jesus Christ? I confess there's a part of me that when we gather with God's people and we sing and we pray and we read God's word and we study the scripture, there's a part of me that would just like to stay here. I feel that way every Sunday. There's always a part of me on Sundays that just wants to think, can't, can't we just stay here? Can't we just stay here in this church building and, and can't we just continue to worship and, and be together with God's people? But verse 10 comes around. We have to go back to our homes. We have to go back to our lives. We go back to jobs and neighborhoods and family. But if you see what the resurrection really means, you'll never go back home the same. If you really see who Jesus is and what he has done, you go back home changed. And the world can see in you the difference the resurrection has made. Everything is made new on the first day of the week as darkness turns to dawning and dawning to noonday bright. For Christ's great kingdom will come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We have a story to tell to the nations. Let's tell it, and let's call them to belief in the only Savior, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we stand in awe at the truth of your word and the wonder of it all. That you would care enough for us to make a way for us. That you being perfectly holy are not able to just simply ignore our sin. And yet in grace and mercy you're not willing to just let us 
slide into judgment, though it's deserved. And so on the cross, you have made a way to uphold perfectly your mercy and your holiness, your grace and your justice. Lord, I pray that we would see it, really see it, not just observe it, not just theorize about it, but truly comprehend who your Son, Jesus Christ, is, what He has done, and the difference it makes for us. Lord, I pray for those who hear this message who believe that it would be with renewed vigor and renewed energy that we would go back to our homes and tell the story that our Savior lives, that we would go back into the world and tell the truth that Jesus reigns and Jesus saves. And Lord, I pray for those who do not believe that through the work of your Holy Spirit, even this moment, that you would draw them to a place of understanding, a place of comprehension, where they would not merely look upon the story of their resurrection, but they would see who Christ is. We thank you this moment for your love and your grace for the sacrifice of your Son, the one who is our Savior, crucified, buried, risen, reigning, one day coming again. Until he comes, let us proclaim the good news that our Savior lives. We ask it in the name of your Son and for his sake. Amen.